Hello, everybody, both the participants of Game Music Festival Volume 4, but also everyone watching this across all space and time. I'm Chris. Uh, before I start, I want to thank Game Music Festival for inviting me. I'm going to give a short talk entitled The Lack Thereof, a story of music's volume in gaming press. Obviously, this is not a talk about myself or my work, but I would still uh, kindly ask you to allow me a few minutes to introduce myself. So my name is Chris Christodoulou. I'm a composer. I've written for uh, films, short and features. I've written for other media projects. I've written standalone compositions, but I mostly work and that's where I make my living in video games. If my name doesn't ring a bell, don't worry. You might have heard of my most well-known project, which is Risk of Rain 2. I've also written for the original Risk of Rain. And uh, most recently for Risk of Rain 2's DLC called Survivors of the Void, which literally just came out a few days ago. And with that, I promise to never say Risk of Rain again for the duration of this talk. So, Risk, I mean, the aforementioned uh, works and some other soundtracks that you have probably never heard of are my main means of uh, making a living, by which I mean that I have a roof above my head, I can put food on the table, I don't need a second job, I can upgrade my computer, my equipment, and maintain this small home studio, which, as far as I'm concerned, is what most of us game composers want and hope to get out of all this. That is the ability to make a decent uh, living out of our music and essentially keep on writing it. The idea of the composer who has assistants and teams and who works for AAA games and uh, has a huge studio and can hire feature players and orchestras. This is a small subgroup in the composer community. I can safely say that most of us pretty much work alone on throughout every stage of the work like composing, recording, performing, mixing, mastering, some of us even implementing, and then of course all the work that it takes to get an album out to you. And unfortunately, most of us remain unknown and unnamed, despite the hard work and despite the quality of the work. The reality is every composer whose name you know is essentially an exception. For every composer you know, there are like 10, 20, 50 other composers struggling to get their music out there, acknowledged, and heard by people, both developers and uh, an audience, and pretty much struggle to make ends meet. Let's put this aside for now. Uh, I hope it will make sense later. And now I want to talk about something less bleak, which is the origins of my love for video game music, which I'm going to take a bit of a liberty here and assume that is something that you and I share. Uh, I have been a gamer for most of my life. My first gaming platform was a Spectrum ZX, and then I moved to an 8086 PC, which has been my platform of choice ever since. I mean the PC, not the 8086. My parents, at the same time, pretty much, enrolled me in a local uh, conservatory. That was, I think, when I was about nine years old. Also, it was back in the 80s in a small town in Greece, so gaming wasn't really a thing. In fact, in our town, we barely even had arcades, let alone like home uh, PCs and computers and stuff. Given that I started learning music and started fooling around on the computer at the same time meant that it was pretty much inevitable that I would notice uh, video game music from my very early uh, experiences with games. I remember many scores from that time which is natural given that we would play a game for months or even years. But I want to share with you a particularly impactful memory, life-changing experience really, in the sense that it practically made me become a video game composer. That game was Monkey Island 2. And you can see I have uh, its cover art here uh, on my wall, featuring the music of Michael Land. Now, uh, the Monkey Island theme is an understatement to call it iconic. It's beautifully composed, it's adventurous, it's swashbuckling, it describes the situation, the mood of the game, the protagonist of the game perfectly, and I would not skip a beat comparing its functionality to that of the theme of Indiana Jones, for example. The thing about Monkey Island 2 was that it introduced a system called iMuse, and this was a dynamic music system similar to F-Mode and Wise. In fact, it was pretty much the grandmother of F-Mode and Wise and all the audio 
middleware that we have now. Taking advantage of the feature set of MIDI, what it could do was do seamless transitions in instrumentation from a solo instrument to entire sections, it could change the tempo, essentially all the information that MIDI contained, it could be changed on the fly depending on the situation on screen or various other triggers. This is of course something that we now pretty much take for granted and we can even do it outside the restrictions of MIDI. We can do it with audio now. But yeah, to my like 12, 13 year old ears, it was literally mind blowing at the time. I, I really fell in love with that thing. Mostly important was that I realized that this is something that only games can do with music. You can't have that on an album, you can't have that on a movie, other than, I don't know, maybe aleatoric compositions of the beginning of the century, I mean the last century now. There's no other place that you could have this flexibility, the potential of a composition being different every single time, but also appropriate every single time. So that was really fascinating. And essentially what happened was that a path that had barely been present on my career map, so to speak, was now practically a one-way street. So let's start with a kind of experiment here. Let me just go online, search for a random games review. I want to open up um, a review from a major publication because that's where the issue is more prominent. I'm going to search, scan the article for the following terms, music, uh, sound and composer. So let, let's check it out. Let's, let's go IGN, I'm gonna do control F, music, zero results on music. Let's do sound, zero results for sound. Let's do composer, okay. Zero results for composer, great. Let's do banner saga, let's do Kotaku. Control F, composer. Nothing for composer. Let's do sound. Okay, we have two results for sound. It says here on paper the banner saga combination. Okay, this is not about sound. It just anyway. Let's do music. No result on music for the banner saga, which has music by Austin Wintery. What other game should we do? Should we do The Witcher Three? Polygon. Control F for music no mention of music composer no audio nothing sound i get two results but i can't find them yeah okay so the sound results are in the comments and it wasn't even about sound should we do another one should we try the last of us let's let's uh, stress test this thing okay i'm gonna open ign again let's do music okay we got one result she'll pick through records at a music store that's the mention of music in The Last of Us. Are you f***ing kidding me? Are you f***ing kidding me with this? <laughs> I can't believe this. This went better than I expected. Sound, the first hit for sound and the only hit for sound is in a comment. And then let's do... <laughs> composer. The Last of Us... They don't mention The Last of Us composer. That's crazy. That's, that's literally crazy. The Last of Us composer is Gustavo Santaolalla. And they don't mention them in the review. Anyway, this really went well. This went, went really well. So I hope that this experiment went the way I expected. Otherwise, it would be pretty embarrassing, but also hopeful. But even if it didn't, I'm sure that repeating it a few times will easily verify that the vast majority of gaming publications, especially major ones, seldom spare more than a couple of sentences of the review uh, real estate on music and sound. Even these laconic inclusions typically stay away from any meaningful criticism. And usually you just get how awesome the music is or that the game has bangers. Uh, which really don't offer any practical insights uh, to the potential reader about how music is deployed in the game and how it works and how it amplifies the experience. Unfortunately, this is the current norm in uh, gaming reviews. I should note here that in the past like decade or so, there's been a bit of a change, uh, especially when we're talking about 
indie uh, sites like small blogs or smaller websites that talk about games. These tend to write about music a bit more. I'm super grateful for it. But on the other hand, it kind of illustrates even more how problematic this is for major websites because it kind of shows that when high level editorial forces are in play, music just doesn't make the cut, which is unfortunate. And I don't mean this in any like conspiratorial sense that there's somebody saying, you know, take away the music or the review won't go live or anything like that. I just actually think that it's mostly due to inertia and this kind of glacial speed that change is happening. Reviews have been written sans music for so long that it's just hard to update our template, essentially. You know, we'll, we'll talk about this and this and this and this and just music isn't part of that. And nobody has thought to like, hmm, maybe we should talk about this element of the game also. So yeah, sadly, not talking about music is the norm. But is it normal? I mean, do we really need music in our game reviews? Does music belong? in game reviews or does it maybe need to just stay in specialized media you know or special articles about best of soundtracks and stuff like that to examine this let us consider what is the point of a review why are we reading them i think that uh, most of us will agree that we read reviews to get a sense of a game will we like it is it worth playing is it worth paying for and if that is the reason that reviews exist, would including music in the mix, pun intended, inform, shape, change our opinion about giving a game a chance? I want to answer this question twofold. On one hand, as a game composer, and admittedly, I'll present some somewhat dubious, non-verifiable data to support my claim. And I also want to offer my personal opinion as just a gamer. And in both cases, my answer is yes. So, as a game composer, I could easily go through my YouTube comments and Twitter mentions and show you a lot of screenshots of the numerous times that people have told me I bought this game because of the music. And I have always replied, I hope you bought the soundtrack because of the game. My apologies if this sounds kind of like an outright brag, but I can assure you this happens to a lot of composers. So yeah, good music drives game sales. This is a fact, non-verifiable, but take my word for it, fact. What is also a fact is that music, good or bad, shapes gaming experiences. I'm not sure I even need to present an argument for that, especially not at this audience. I could again cite numerous and oftentimes touching uh, testimonies about the role and impact that a music can have on a gaming session, especially in games where you invest multiple hours of gameplay like Risk of... Oops, sorry, I said I would not mention it. But I don't need to, you know, cite other people's uh, thoughts about that. I have my own experiences, experiences that I'm sure that all of us have. I don't believe there's a single person who loves games that hasn't had this experience, this connection with music shaping their experience while they're playing. After all, the participants of Game Music Festival that are in London right now to watch the concerts, that's why you're there, to, to share this experience, to make it common. For example, we have all felt this excitement of opening a game and listening to the main theme. We have all been pumped uh, to fight a boss when the boss fight music kicks in. We have all felt uh, high tension from a great horror score. And we have all been transported to a different era by Cuphead's jazz extravaganza and mesmerized by the fantastical lyrical melodies of Ori. Can any of us honestly say that these games would have been the same without their soundtracks? And the thing is, we cannot say that for any game at all. It would have been different by default. Uh, with a different soundtrack, good or bad, better or worse, it would just be a different game. Music is inseparable from the experience. Just like uh, you can't separate the game from its graphics or even from its core mechanics. At this point, I want to make a, a, a small confession. I told a little white lie before, not, not exactly a lie, but a half truth. I said that I love uh, video game music, which is a fact, but sometimes I just don't like it. Uh, and this is exactly because I love it, because I have this investment. So 
it's confusing. Let me explain. I love the idea of video game music, this concept, which is incorporated in visual arts from the times of antiquity, essentially, that we can use music to enhance, amplify, underscore, underline, call it whatever you want, the stories that we tell, the situations we encounter in the games that we play. That is what I love, and that is what I want to, you know, celebrate. But not all game music is good. And I don't mean good as in good music, you know, because you can even have great music but not fit the game, if that makes sense. And honestly, sometimes the game music just sucks. And before everybody gets all excited in the comments and stuff, don't say that you've never done it. Don't say that you've never went to the menu and turned the music off. So there's the concept of video game music, which I love, and there's the application of it, which I want to love. And that is what I want to see criticized and scrutinized and analyzed and discussed in the gaming press. Because, sure, I'm super flattered when a review spares a couple of lines saying that, you know, my music was a banger. Uh, but how does this show its function in the game? Games are not jukeboxes. Uh, we don't play games to listen to music. We, a DJ doesn't come with his PlayStation at the club, you know? You don't take your Xbox plug headphones and go jogging. And I'm saying this because I want to make clear that my petition here is not to have more articles generally about game music and game composers. I don't want, I don't want album reviews. There's a specialized press for that and they're doing their job and they're doing it well and that's all fine. No, the issue here is the need for actual discourse for analysis in the mainstream gaming press on why and how music is deployed in a game and to what extent, to what degree this is successful at enhancing the gaming experience in both practical and artistic ways. So maybe we should spend some time laying down some of the actual music parameters that could potentially be included in a game review. The most obvious one, or should I say audible one, is aesthetics. Arguably the primary role of a game soundtrack is to enhance, reinforce, formulate, potentially even counteract uh, the game's aesthetics. Like, while graphics are commonly the, the, the most important factor in the aesthetics of a game, uh, it's easy to see how music can have a crucial uh, role in giving a game a certain patina. There are cases where this is obvious. For example, you have a pixel art game that uses chiptune music to kind of cement the retroness of it all. But there are times where graphics are second fill to this and uh, the true stylistic driving force is music. Uh, the graphics in the Le Noir depict uh, 40s New York realistically. The people are kind of depicted realistically. The clothes are uh, era appropriate and all that stuff. But the truth is that music is what brings the whole thing together. Essentially, without music, there's a noir in L.A. Noir. Another example could be uh, the Civilization games. The overall style, the, the overall visual stylization uh, does not really adapt to times and peoples. You know, you, the, the way the world is stylized kind of remains the same. Of course, you have different architectures or vehicles or uh, units and all that stuff, but they're all drawn with the same style. Music is the one that kind of distinguishes the era and the peoples and all that stuff. Bringing in an example from a game I've worked on, Deadbolt, the game uses pixel art throughout uh, and there are different gangs and each of them has uh, unique sprites, but their subcultures are confirmed essentially by music. These games would have had a hard time uh, establishing a distinct or differentiating style without their soundtracks. Moving on from the aesthetic coding, which can occasionally be superficial, for example, you know, like racing or sports games, um, music is also used to support game mechanics, or even as a unique mechanic in itself. And that also happens in both conscious and unconscious ways. I'm going to give a few examples. There are, of course, rhythm games like Crypt of the Necrodancer or, I don't know, Guitar Hero. And here music essentially is the mechanic. And uh, as such, it cannot be left out of a review. I'm uh, pretty sure 
that there's still room for improvement, and especially in musical nomenclature. I know that this will come as a shock, but there are synonyms to bangers. But I would expect that the vocabulary will come naturally once we kind of incorporate music criticism in our reviews. Then there's the use of music uh, for storytelling. The huge elephant in the room here is Journey. Austin's score has certainly had uh, its fair share of the limelight. But I sometimes feel that the deservingly celebrated music of Journey kind of provides an alibi for the press's otherwise radio silence. What about a Hyperlight Drifter, uh, a game that features no text and uh, in which Rich Freeland's music does way more than set the mood? And there's the 40s music of Fallout or the radio stations in, in Grand Theft Auto. Both of those examples are ones that music constantly balances between the aesthetic and the storytelling, not so far as telling a story, but establishing the world. And tangential to storytelling is, of course, the use of music to designate locations, characters, via specific themes and light motifs. Again, using Monkey Island as an example, every location has a theme. Recurring characters have light motifs that are uh, steady throughout the series. Truth be told, in all the above cases, narration or establishing a world or timelines or identifying characters, the lines between aesthetic and practical are blurred. Essentially, all music has an aesthetic role, even if it's, you know, very mechanical in its application. And this is yet another thing that could be discussed in a review, essentially. Look, how, this is exactly what I'm talking about. Another common use of music is to convey um, crucial information. We are pretty much all familiar with that, but to give a few examples, in Song of Horror, the presence, which is like the antagonist, like this entity, is closing in and you get to hear it through music cues and stuff. In Broken Swords, I know, I'm, I'm old, <laughs> sorry. You hear an uplifting music cue that lets you know that you've either solved a puzzle or you have done something that has moved the plot forward. And uh, of course, when you clear uh, a room from your uh, enemies in Doom, the outro music is cued where it you know, kind of plays the last bars. And I don't know if there's any player that has played Doom which hasn't gotten a Pavlovian reaction to that with a like a breathe out reaction. Finally, to avoid this getting extremely long, I will group the following mechanical deployments of music into the category which I call in the zone, and it kind of falls into the subconscious use. And this relates to the different ways that music urges the player to persevere. There are many different approaches to this, but the goal is to carry the player through the next obstacle. For example, by getting in the zone in uh, let's say antechamber, the Talos principle, uh, manifold garden, you achieve this deep focus needed to solve the next kind of mind-bending puzzle. Getting in the zone uh, allows you to play one more loop, one more level, one more turn, one more quest, fight through the impossible boss fight and so on and so forth. Bottom line is that for all the above scenarios, the degree to which music is successfully applied both artistically and technically, is a discussion which, in my opinion, fits and belongs in a review. Now, as I said, the reason we read reviews is to help us decide whether we should play a game or not. Of course, under the current economic system, play is intrinsically tied to buy, which arguably adds a certain responsibility to the proverbial reviewer. There's another hidden aspect to the reviewer's responsibility though, and I would argue this is more important, and it actually involves a process which is independent from the reviewer's intent and kind of cumulatively builds up and has an impact in the long term. And it is the function of reviews and criticism as catalysts for any medium's improvement. Because through constructive criticism, we are motivated to move forward, to compete, to overcome, to surpass and to thrive, essentially. We learn from our mistakes and from other people's successes. We hone in our skills. We aim with an improved accuracy. And in both art and craft, and I do believe that games is kind of an amalgam of both, criticism has historically been a driving force for adaptation, 
evolution, and revolution. For that reason, I'm confident that the inclusion of music criticism in game reviews will inevitably lead to better music in our games. Finally, there's another aspect to this, and I've sort of hinted at it at the beginning, so I'll try to connect the dots here. As I said, most game composers really struggle to make ends meet. Uh, a small game gig, which is what most of us get to do for at least the first few years of our career, if not for the entirety of our career, pays from absolutely nothing to very little. I remember my first gaming job, uh, I got paid 180 euro and i was lucky to even get that most composers will do the first few gigs for game jumps or for exposure the former is perfectly fine the latter can be less than fine the reality of the industry is such that the vast majority of game composers are freelancers very few people are you know part of a company and are in-house composers as we say so we don't really have steady paychecks we kind of rely on the next gig and whatever money we get from streaming, selling our soundtracks on Bandcamp and uh, other platforms. I perfectly understand that the press is not responsible for that. It's not up to them to guarantee a, a means of making a living to the composer community. But I also know that it would be a huge help if a composer's work was mentioned in reviews, even in a negative light, because as I said, criticism, you get to learn from your mistakes. You get to see what works, what doesn't work. And that, of course, will make you better and then you can get more jobs. But beyond that, having our names acknowledged and mentioned would mean that our work would no longer be taken for granted. And we are kidding ourselves if we think that the state in the industry right now is otherwise. Game composers' work is taken 100% for granted. I will spare you the rant right now, but... We all know that there's a lot of work to be done on that department. So yeah, getting our names out there, because that will introduce us to more developers when they read a review and they see, okay, this music works and it's applied in an interesting way that might lead to your next job. And will also introduce us to our audiences because it's a very different thing for a fan to be a fan of the game's music and a different thing to be a fan of the composer of the game's music. This has a huge impact in the long run, uh, establishing a fun base of your own and not of, you know, game X. And yeah, it would, it would be a tremendous help for all of us composers. So to start wrapping this up, in the past 10 or so years that I've been in the industry, I have confronted many reviewers about uh, not including music in the reviews and I've seen other composers doing so too. I've always tried to be polite and playful about it but I can assure you that every time I read a review for one of my games for which music is essentially muted I can't help but feel kind of disappointed and it sort of makes me feel like an outsider in the gaming industry. One common and I honestly valid excuse I hear from journalists is that they don't feel comfortable and knowledgeable enough to tackle music and I completely hear that but what kind of knowledge are we talking about here? I mean actual theoretical knowledge uh, of music is not a requirement. Uh, most of dedicated music critics are not musicians or have you know theoretical knowledge about music. They just have listened to a lot of music with a critical and attentive ear. Uh, and I don't think that most game reviewers are programmers, designers, 3D or 2D artists, any of the many, many jobs that feeds into making a game. So yeah, nobody expects from you to be an expert. And honestly, just as one can acquire familiarity with all other intricacies of gaming, as I've just mentioned, which is definitely not an easy task, it is entirely within anyone's potential to train their gaming ears particularly in regards to the aesthetics, which can sometimes be harder. Uh, again, no one is bored erudite. In fact, the cultivation of our ear canal is something that we all do consciously or not by just mere exposure to music. And the only thing that it takes is kind of flipping a mental switch that says that I'm now listening passively and switching it into listening actively. So while I can understand an initial uncomfortableness, I think it's definitely worth putting the time and that there's a good uh, payoff at the end. And you then recognize better music for yourself, which is just an added bonus.
The bottom line is that talking about the function of music and games in a critical manner can only be beneficial for all involved parties. Developers and composers would get proper feedback on their technical application. Gamers would gain a better understanding of the intricacies of music and in turn develop an ear for details that could otherwise, you know, go unnoticed. And this kind of dialectical interaction between creators and consumers would lead to a healthy demand for better music. And one final thought, there's a recurring debate for years now about games being art or not. And if we truly believe that they are, I would say that leaving one unequivocally artistic element out of the conversation is something that we cannot afford. And at the end of the day, I think our composers deserve better. Thank you for watching. I was Chris Christodoulou for Game Music Festival. Bye-bye.